remain standing for today's scripture reading. Okay, today's scripture is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. We'll be reading responsibly. <coughs> Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. All right. Let your request be made known unto God. Mm -hmm. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. All together. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good and forth, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Hallelujah. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. All right, all right. Now you may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're excited today because we have a slight change of events. I won't be speaking today, and I'm excited because we have a power pack speaker today in Sister Beverly Stewart Anderson. Somebody say amen. amen. I asked her for a bio. She refused to give it to me. I told her I'd be able to find out information about you some other way. And so we praise the Lord that I gathered some info about her, and she is the baby child of seven children, born in Kinlock. Amen. Kenlock, Missouri. There was, a, there was a place called Kenlock. Praise the Lord. She graduated from Kenlock Senior High School and then matriculated to the University of Missouri in St. Louis. She is the proud mother of two sons, Jeremy and Carlton, who she also calls Pootie. Pootie. Pootie, stand on up so everybody can see who her Pootie Pie is. And he's a strong man. He doesn't mind being called Pootie. Amen. She also has a daughter-in-law. Her name is Dondalyn, and she has a granddaughter by the name of Kyra. Uh, Beverly has performed in many musical events. She has performed with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, with the Black Repertory Theater, and many other places. She is employed by St. Andrew's Methodist Church, and many of her family members from that church is here today. Just raise your hands if you're here to support Beverly. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And many others here. Uh, she works for the state of Missouri. She is a professional singer and loves music. She is a member of the Tabernacle of Praise here. She, was our, she is our Sabbath school director and our mus music minister. And um, she is just a, 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 a woman of power. Um, when you see Beverly, Beverly is often excited. She's often in, trying to inspire us towards worship. And, um, but little people know, little people know, Beverly, uh, many times when she's here in the sanctuary by herself, is literally on the floor of the sanctuary praying for her people. Um, Beverly is one whom you can bring aside and talk to about personal matters. Um, not only does she live publicly for the Lord, but she lives privately for the Lord as well. Amen. And so we praise the Lord that we have a leader and a minister as Beverly. And uh, if there was any mother of the church, usually mothers of the church are older than you, significantly older than you. But Beverly, Beverly would fit one of those roles as sort of a mother of the church. Amen. And so we're excited to hear the word of God through our maidservant, Sister Beverly Stewart Anderson, after the song.
God, everybody. Glory to God, everybody. The Bible said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Somebody said, let some drops now fall on me. You know what you think about that? If God from heaven will let just one drop fall, think about the fall, the fact that it's coming down through the atmosphere and it's coming all the way down through the clouds. And by the time the drop hits you, you ought to be moved in some way. Let some drops now fall on me. I don't know what you came to do today, but I am totally committed. I am determined that I'm going to give God some Holy Ghost praise in God's house. Amen? What's the song, Kim, that I want to sing? We have come to praise him. Help me out, choir. I need to get to that one. Stand up and help me out. It says, we have come to praise him. We have come to praise him. Just sing, come on, y'all. We have come to praise him. We have come to praise him.
asked to take this appointment today, I realized that I'm not worthy to stand in this place. I realized that all the sins and all the things I've ever done in my life that I don't deserve to be here. As a matter of fact, I deserve to be dead. As a matter of fact, I said I deserve to be dead, but because of the grace and mercy of God, I'm here today. You gotta turn me down somewhere. I am so happy to be able to say a word for the Lord. I'm happy because my friends are here. Friends from St. Andrew United Methodist Church. Friends from North Park United Methodist Church. Friends from my job, Beverly. And I just have friends that are there. So I want you all to pray with me as we go before the throne. Dear God in heaven, you have brought us here today to receive a message from on high. God, I, I come as an empty vessel needing to be filled. Lord, I know that it's nothing but the goodness that you've granted me to stand in this place. So God, I accept the appointment. God, I accept before you boldly asking you to move me out of the way. Lord, clear my mind and clear my heart of any foolishness that does not represent you. So God, I love you and I come now asking you to just go out, take the words from my mouth and let it go into the hearts and to the mind and to the ears of the people that are here to receive it. God, we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank the musician that's here for us today, Mark. Amen. Amen. Isaac Williams is out of town, visiting with his dad, and we called Mark on the fly. We called him yesterday afternoon. And you know, Carol, that's what I like about it. I've got some good friends. And I called him up, and I said, look, I need you. And he said, listen, I need to change some things around and make some things happen. And he's here today. And he came out and worked with us last night, so we praise God for you for that. Amen. 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 You've heard over and over again different sayings that people talk, and they say, I will give you a piece of my mind. You need to set your mind to it. You said, never mind. Or you might say, bear in mind. And then you might also say, keep this thought in and you, then the Bible teaches us that we need to be of the same. Uh huh. And then you might say to somebody, they might do something to you, and you might say, uh-huh, I mind. And then you might say to someone that's particularly nosy, you might say to them, uh, Paul, you need to mind your own business. <laughs> and then you might walk over to somebody else and you say, listen, I've got a good mind to give you a piece of my mind, the little bit that you have. It says, in my mind's eye. And then the military decided to come through and they say, a mind is a terrible thing to wait. Sometimes you're in relationships and you know you get with a man and the experience is so good and you say, man, that was mind blowing. See, some of y'all never had your mind blowed before. Just keep living. <laughs> and then you say, honey, you need to have an open mind. And then you might say, mind your manners. And then there was a wrestler that came along when I was a little girl, and he used to say, it messes with the mind. He'd get in there and do his little thing. And then there was another person that said, mind your P's and Q's. He or she loves to play mind games. You know how your relationships, and oftentimes men and women, <laughs> ha -ha, like to play mind games games. And then you say to him or her, just pay them no mind. And then you need to say, honey, you need to make up your mind. And then you say, you might say, well, would you mind if I did this or if I did that? And then I'm a musician. So you know I have to come to it from a song. There's a song that some girls that used to sing and it says, free your mind and the See, you know the heathens out there, they know the song. And all of y'all didn't used to be saved, so some of y'all know these songs. They say, free your mind and the rest will follow. And then there's another one. I'm a romantic, I'm hopeless romantic, and I still don't have anybody, but I'm still a hopeless romantic. I'm still looking. I know some of y'all worried about that, but some of y'all still looking too. Keep looking. You're going to find somebody, right? All right. So there's a song that says, when you find it, and you know some of you, I've been in love before and got dropped. But I'm still looking. So there was a song I used to sing. I've got love on my mind. 
listen to them. They know these songs, Pastor. They know these songs. But then the one that I like the best, the one of the songs that I like the best, is talking about a man when he's in a relationship, Paul. And this is a man that understands, understands relationship. This is a man that has a woman that he has lost his entire mind over. And he can't do nothing, so he decides to sit down and sing this song. When a man loves a woman, can't keep his mind on nothing else. Y'all don't know that one, huh? That's the situation that you, we're going to talk about today. When a man loves a woman. So there's a question that has been asked over the history of time. If I was going to give this message a title, I would call it, What's on Your Mind? Turn to your neighbor and say, What's on Your Mind? Turn to your other neighbor and say, what's on your mind? I could imagine in my sanctified, holy mind that there was something happening up in heaven. And we go all the way back. There was something going on. They tell me that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit perhaps were having a conversation. And I could just imagine. You know, the Bible said that at the creation that was written that it said that uh, let us make man in our own image Okay, so that me hour means that there were at least two of them there. And I could imagine in my mind, Jesus hanging over in heaven, hanging over in space. I don't know how they hung up there, Pastor. I don't know if they were walking because the Bible said that God had a mouth. So I imagine if he had a mouth, he had some feet and some legs and some hands. The Bible said that Jesus is seated at the right hand. But I could just imagine in my mind, my imagination, that Jesus was kicking back in heaven. Maybe he was sitting down and God was over there and he... He was pondering a thought. And Jesus looked over there and he said, God, what's, what's on your mind? And I can imagine God stretched back and he said, you know what? I think that I'm going to do something here. And God said, what's on my mind? And God said, in the book of Genesis, we go back to the creation. In the beginning, it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So I think God just answered Jesus and said, listen, I'll tell you what's on my mind. The heavens and the earth. And then one thing about it, God, he began to just speak things, and they were. He just said, let there be, and there was. And God created the stars and the moon and the sun and the light, and he separated the day from night, separated the waters, and he did all that good stuff. And I imagine he was still sitting down, and he was pondering this thought, Kim. I could imagine that Jesus looked at God again, and God said, God, what's on your mind? God said, you know, I put all this nice stuff out here. And he said, you know what, I think I'll make me a man. And God started doing some stuff. And he started breathing into man the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And then I could just imagine that old Adam got up and started looking around. Now you can imagine if, a if Adam, first man being born, he was perfect in every way. Now, you think my sons are good looking. I don't believe they had anything on Adam. That don't get you. They're good looking. Hey, man, they're my children. I get to say that. But I can imagine that Adam was perfect. And Adam was looking around there. He said, I got all this stuff. I see two of this. And this is my imagination. I see two of that, two monkeys, two cows, two chickens, male and female. And God said, I'm going to do something about that. So Adam probably looked at God and said, God, what's on, what's on your mind? Put him to sleep reached in there and got a rib out. See, that's what I like about it. God reached in there and made Adam a woman. And when Adam saw that woman, I could just imagine somebody asking him the question, man, what's on your mind? He said, I got this fine chick that God went inside of me and made a woman for me. And see, the thing about it, God went in and made Eve a part of who Adam is. You see, and so this whole business about marriage, women, I'm going to talk to the ladies a little bit, men, close your ears. When we start to think about a husband, a lot of times we don't let God do the picking. But if you see from the beginning, God did the picking for Adam. You know why? Adam didn't even have sense enough to pick him a woman, so God just gave him one. God went in there and designed him a perfect woman. So maybe if we wait and let God... Go and get a man and reach inside there and get something out and put it inside of you, then maybe we'll be better off for it. Amen? Amen. So this morning, I'm going to ask you the question again. What's on your mind? 
Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform, conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your I'm going to say that again. It says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind then. That's the last part of that. You will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, if you really want to know what God's perfect will is, the Bible says that we have to be renewed and we have to be transformed. So to be transformed from where you are, you have to have a different experience, right? You have to have something new happen inside of you. Some changes have to be made. Now, most people don't want to be told that what they're doing is not absolutely right. Now, is it anybody in here that does everything absolutely right? No. You know, every once in a while, somebody has to come up beside you, Mark, and say, uh, uh, Mark, that tie that you're wearing doesn't quite match those shoes that you wear. Every now and then, your wife tell you something like that. Do you want to hear that? I know you didn't. <laughs> he said he didn't want to hear that. Every once in a while, when you're taking piano lessons, and I didn't like my piano lesson teacher very well, and I had the woman for many years, and she would come in there and make you feel so bad when you had not practiced. She would hit you on your hand, tell you she's going to tell your mama, tell you you ain't no good because you should have practiced your lesson. You're coming in here wasting your mama money. And you know what? She was fair. She told my brother, don't come back. You're so bad. Don't come back. You're totally wasting your mother's money. But we didn't want to hear it. But the one thing that I understood about being a better musician, about playing the piano and going to the get the better grade, I had to transform my thinking. I had to understand that I needed to practice so that I could be perfect. Now, what happens to people when they come into God's house? They come into God's house thinking they know everything already. Hmm? They come in and they tell you all about the world. And they want you to know that they were the biggest sinner in the world. And they look for somebody that has done as much or more sin as them so they can brag about it. And that's all right. Sometimes other people need to know that they're not the only person that made some mistakes. But then at some point in your life, you need to be trying to figure out how to transform from that behavior. Amen. Now, I know this is not going to hurt. Some of this is really bad. So you might as well just get ready for it. It's coming. We sit around as Christians. I'm, I'm getting ready to ask you what's on your mind. We sit around as Christian pastor, and we come to church one way, and we don't even let the sun get down on Saturday night making preparations to become someone else. And then they have something called Facebook. Uh-huh. Now, Facebook can be a wonderful thing, but it can be a destroyer of the mind. Now, one thing that I know about Facebook is that I don't like it. I mean, I'm out there, and they tell me they put a whole bunch of cards, sent me happy birthday cards, so if you're here, I'm going to say thank you for the card. I still haven't looked at it yet, but I appreciate what you've done for me to send it to me. But you look on Facebook sometimes, and people are talking about things that are unnecessary to their life. Amen. Now, I'm talking about, I'm going to even lead the worldly people out, and I'm going to talk about the Christians. Now, how do you think that you're going to invite your friends to church on Saturday morning when you just wrote to them that you were blazing drunk on Thursday night? Now, I told you you weren't going to like this, but the truth is going to have to come from somebody, and I may not get this opportunity again, so I'm just going to rip it where I can. You need to find yourselves not conforming to this world. And there's no way that you're going to have your mind accurately thinking if you are constantly putting things into your temple that doesn't represent a holy God. Now, somebody said to me, somebody said to me, well, Beverly, you know, what's wrong with drinking? I said, there's nothing wrong with drinking because you need some water to live. Amen. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with drinking. You need some juice. It's out there. It tastes good. But why wouldn't you want to put something into your body that God made? You know what? I'm so excited about the fact that God made us. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm so happy to be woke. I'm so happy to be alive. And I tell people, listen. 
I wouldn't put a thief in my mouth to steal my brain. Now, I got that from John Wayne that was on a movie one night. He was drinking, and a nun said to him, listen, I wouldn't put a thief in my mouth to steal my brain. In other words, in other words, alcohol. Why would you put alcohol in your brain to make you be something different than what God made you? Now, I know, I know people don't like this, and people say, you know, when I was drunk, I gave them a piece of my mind. Well, why couldn't you give them a piece of your mind when you weren't drunk? Because then maybe you would have said something that made sense to them. You see, and people... People don't want to talk about it because they think, oh, I'm just socially drinking. It's okay for me to take a little hit because, you know, Jesus drank wine. But I promise you, whatever Jesus drank and drunk or whatever, he was not acting foolish after it got into his system. Amen. So let's talk about smoking a little bit. On, you know what? My ex-husband used to smoke. Mouth was stinking from the front to the back. He would be doing all kinds of things to make his mouth fresh. It's already bad enough when you wake up in the morning and your natural tendency is your breath not to be fresh. Huh? And then you take something that somebody has sold you in a package and conditioned it and fashioned it and made it look to you like it was glamorous. Young people, don't do it. I wish I had a picture of a lung in here that's just naturally black from where. And I'm just telling you this because God wants us to keep these temples in a good, nice fashion, in a nice way. So when you say, I can't do it, I'm going to tell you you can't because the Bible says that we need to begin to renew our minds. Let me tell you something. In Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, you were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Now, you know, we have a lot of desires and a lot of times desires are good in the right place. But the Bible just talked about deceitful desires. I was talking to a man the other night, and he was saying to me, he said, Beverly, there's no way that we can be in relationship. And why do I keep running into men, nice men, Pastor? Men that have jobs. And ladies, that's important, right? <laughs> men that have jobs. Men that are educated. At least they have a bachelor's degree. And they walk up to you, and they say, hey, hot mama. And they look good to me, and I say, hey, hi, Papa, you know, so we engage in a conversation. So then you start to trying to impress them. You know, the pastor said, Beverly, I hear you talking country. I can talk country, and I can talk this way, too. And so I begin to bring my voice down, and I start batting my eyes a little bit, and I start trying to walk a little cute so they can see me and notice me, and we start engaging in conversation. Now, there used to be a time when I would say to a man, okay, let's, let's, let's keep talking. Let's keep talking. But now I have sense enough to know, Michelle, that when I enter into a relationship, I said, I don't need to waste any more of my time, and I don't need you to waste any more of your time. Let me just tell you about me. I'm a church girl. And they say, what? Say, I know a lot of church girls, and they're about some of the worst people in the world. And I say, yeah, I used to be one of them. I used to be one of them, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Say, but I am a church girl now, and I've decided one thing. Ladies, it's easy to do. It's easy enough to do in the beginning. Don't let them trap you, because once you get in there, it's going to be hard to try to convince them that you're a Christian. When you first meet them, you look them straight in the face. Come here, Kwame, and stand right here. He's scared to come. <laughs> so you get the leverage on them. Make sure you're standing up high over them, too. <laughs> and when they're talking to you, look them straight in the face. Listen, you tell them, I want to be saved. Now, I'm going to tell you this works from experience. Some, I read in a book, Effective Speakers, you can talk about two things. You can talk about something that you're an expert in, or you can talk about your experiences. So I can talk about my experiences. So I haven't been meeting young men, and I've been telling them flat out, I want to be saved. On, and they said, well, I'm not where you at right now. You know, say, I, I really would like to be with somebody like you in about 10 or 15 years. Say, I, I really don't mind being around you. I think you fly. I think you're nice. You know, it, you got it going on. But I'm not where you are. And I say, I'm not where I need to be because I'm still trying to get closer to God. And still, so what am I trying to do? I'm trying to renew my mind. So how do we find out how is it that we change our mind and our behavior? Anything that you do. When I used to run track, I had to practice. Hmm? I had to get out on the track and get sore 
in between seasons and when you start again, my thighs would be hurting me, right, Carol? And my calves and everything would be hurting me. But I kept doing it because I wanted to win the race. And when you ask people to say something about God, Christians that have been in the church for a long time, they really don't know what to say because we don't know how to practice praying. We don't know how to practice getting in to God's word. Let me tell you something. What goes in here is what comes out of here. I remember back in the day we used to watch Little House on the Prairie. Y'all never watched it? Y'all didn't watch Little House on the Prairie? I'm going to find something that you used to watch. Romper Room. Whatever happened to John Boy? Good night, John Boy. Good night, Sally Sue Ann. Good night, Rebecca, and all of those names. And then the Brady Bunch. You know, three little boys, or six boys, or whatever it is. The Courtship of Eddie's Father. Remember that one? Andy Griffin. One of my favorites. The Rifle Man. That man could pull that rifle out, and I mean, he could bring them down in just a matter of seconds. But you know what? Today, what are we watching? You know, when I talked to one of my bosses, and she said she has a series of books on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I have never in my life seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer because just the word vampire does something to me. Now, what do you need to know about a vampire? I mean, I'm serious. I mean, Christian or non-Christian, why do you even need to put that in your brain? Pastor, why would somebody need to know about a vampire? Why would we need to know about vampires? But these people are studying it. They've written series of books about vampires. Then they're watching Friday the 13th. How many of y'all watched it? See, I know y'all need to, this church now, somebody watched it. And then, now, okay, so when, uh, how many people in here actually have Cinemax? HBO. HBO and Cinemax. I used to have it, and I could not flip my channel without seeing somebody's body exposed that I didn't want to see. And I mean, we have it. We let our children see it. We let them watch it. And then we want to understand why they go to school acting so crazy. Because we have allowed them to put this into their mind. What's on your mind today? What have you thought about this week? You see, you have to stop letting the devil. We've got to take back what the devil has stolen, stolen from us. We need to go to the Bible and we need to go to some scriptures. Let's go to Romans 12, 2. Okay, let's go to Ephesians 4, 22. We already read that one. Ephesians 4, 22 and 23. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, I cannot talk enough about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. One of the things that I wanted to do when I was talking to a gentleman, I said, you know what, I have a, a thing that I want to do called drive out negative thinking. Drive out negative thinking. You know, a lot of times we have an opportunity to push in positive thoughts. But we continue to dwell on negative things. And the only way that you're going to push out the negative is if you push in the positive. Last week, the pastor was talking to us about the book of James. Now, people say, look, I really don't know how to read the Bible. See, that's something that people used to be able to say because we weren't taught to read. But see, now you can get on the Internet, and the Internet will read to you. Amen. They have a Bible now where they'll just read it to you. Ask me, I'll give it to you. You can go there and read it. See, one thing that we need to understand about who we are and what we put into our system is the fact that you have total control of your mind right. when you're not drinking, when you're not doing cocaine, and when you're not doing marijuana. See, people don't want to hear that. Young people are sniffing, and they are doing drugs. And everybody's scared to talk about it. You need to tell your children, don't come up in here with that mess. And as a matter of fact, you need to leave them. Some of you are still smoking dope right now. And getting high and bragging about it. 
See, that's negativity. You know, and people just shaking their heads like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Not in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Not in the tabernacle of praise. Indeed, it is happening. And so what do we need to do? We need to practice reading and saying the scripture. I remember when we were kids, we had to learn the memory verse. Everything that you do in life, in order to become a good auditor, Shamika, you got to practice how to do the work. So what does it mean to practice the scripture, to practice, to pray? One thing we start with the, our Father, who art in heaven. And everything about that prayer is our. Has nothing to do with your selfishness. Has nothing to do with my, everything that Jesus talked about. Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. So why is it that a sister in the church is ever hungry? And you don't know about it. Because they're scared to tell you. Why are they scared to tell us? Because we don't have any joy. And let me tell you something. There are some evil people in the world. Straight up evil. And that can change. And let me ask you to do something right now. You need to make yourself a committee of one and ask yourself the question. First thing you need to identify, what in your life is it? Lord, what do I need to change? I mean, right now, seriously, stop and think. What, Lord, do I need to change? And if you don't think that you need to make some changes, there is the problem right there. Because everyone, everyone that's still living, standing on the top of the ground, needs to go to the scriptures and read the scriptures to find out what it is that, where you need to make a change. Amen. And I'm telling you, when the pastor nailed it, when he said, you know, you need to go to the book of James. Mm. Promise me that when you leave here today, you'll go to the book of James. Because in the book of James, it just straight up tells you, just like he said, if you are a liar, you need to quit lying. And you know you're lying. If you're committing adultery, you need to quit. Right, if you're backstabbing, you need to quit. If you're just looking at people just because you can't stand the way they praise God, you need to stop. That's right, that's right. You need to find some joy of your own. Huh? That's right, if you don't have any joy, you need to go to the Bible. That's right. Because it's joy all in the Bible. And the Bible will straighten you out and make you feel so bad and cut you up and then have the nerve to put some band-aids on you all in the same book. Amen. Amen. How is it that a Christian doesn't have any joy? How is it that we keep talking about being depressed? Looking at y'all, some of y'all sometimes, boy, I start sinking low. (laughs) But something inside of me says, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm not about to get on that bandwagon because I don't know what's wrong with them, but it ain't wrong with me. So when you see me going around somewhere trying to offer somebody some joy, listen, I got some joy in my life. Why? Because I take the opportunity and the privilege to serve a holy God. See, uh, uh, most of us act like we don't even understand that it was God that woke us up this morning. Most of us act like we don't understand that it's nothing that you can do that has brought you to the place that you are in. Black folks now got big houses. And now I'm going to help you to remember, when we only had two bedrooms in a whole house, I'm talking about the whole house, your mom and your daddy slept in one room, and everybody else slept in the other. Then we got fancy enough to get a little piece of house built on the back, called it a new addition, stretched out the kitchen a little bit, got another bedroom, put the boys over here, put the girls over here, and mom and daddy in that one room. And I remember when we didn't even have the air conditioners that cooled the whole house. Y'all sit there like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Put one little air conditioner in a window. Remember that? And then close the doors to the rest of the house and sit down in there and get cool. And let me tell you what it did. It gave us family time together. Gave us a time to sit down together and crack open peanuts. Turn on the TV and watch wrestling at the chase. Gave us a chance to talk. See, y'all didn't do nothing together, but we did do it together. We were watching wrestling at the chase, but it gave us a time to have some family life together. And I dare you to get with your children and try to read the Bible. My brother, Sherman, I'll call his name, his kids might be watching. He used to read a little bit slower. Make me so mad, Michelle. He would say, Paul, for this reason, I bow. And before he could get through, I say, I bow my knees to the face of the Father. My mother said, "Uh uh-uh. 
My mother said, listen, listen, listen. Everybody in this house is going to practice reading God's scripture. So why is it that you're so unhappy? Because you don't know God. It's no way in the world that you could keep coming running in here and then running out being miserable. How do you come into God's house on God's holy Sabbath day? And, and the other thing, when God was thinking in his mind, he made Adam and Eve and all that stuff. And then God said, listen, on the seventh day, God's holy Sabbath. He said, listen, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. Not because he was tired, Paul, because all he said was let there and there it was. But God stopped what he was doing. And then when Adam woke up the seventh day and he began to look around and say, God, you did all of that for me. That's what God did for us. God wants us to come aside from the work that we do seven days a week and stop and look back and see what he's done. See, you want to put something in your mind, you start thinking about heaven. When was the last time you thought about heaven? Raise your hand. Now, I'm, I'm really being serious. Don't get go up. Jesus is watching. I thought about just today. Just today. Just today, Michelle. I thought about it just today. Listen, listen, listen. I, I encourage you to go home and find out what you think they're going to be doing in heaven. And then you have to ask the question, when you start reading about what's going to be happening in heaven, let me tell you something, I got an imagination that's out of this world. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be looking for Jesus, and I'm going to say, Jesus, I want to do a duet with you. See, let me tell you something, don't, don't mess with my, my imagination, you got your own. When I get to heaven, I'm going to stand up there with Jesus, and I ain't going to need no microphone, I won't even need no piano. Me and Jesus just going to break back, and we just going to start singing. Now, Michelle, I don't know how I'm going to get to your mansion. I don't know if I'm going to be flying, if I'm going to be walking, if I'm going to be swimming, but I'm going to check out your mansion when I get there. Let me tell you something. If you have no desire to get to heaven, you won't go. See, people start packing up. I've never been to Jamaica, but I'm going. And I got to read and find out what they do in Jamaica. I ain't going to go over there in Jamaica with no fur and mink on in June. Because I read, I read somewhere in some travel magazine that it's hot over there in June. And they swimming in that water. I mean, they kicking back, boy. I mean, to tell you, I'm going to lose some weight before I go to Jamaica because I'm going to swim in that water too. But let me tell you something. I had to read and study it and understand it. So why are people talking about heaven and have no clue about what they do in heaven? I heard somebody say the other day that somebody was singing in the heaven with the angels. I couldn't even say nothing to them because the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible tells us that when a man dies, that the, the, you know what, man, the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. So why do we stand and preach about the resurrection? Why do we talk about Jesus is coming back to get the people that are dead? So stop telling people that somebody is in heaven singing with the angels. They're not there. But one thing about it, when they get up on that great getting the morning, how they might be able to sing their way into heaven, I don't know how to get there. But you need to begin to think about heaven. Do you know the dimensions of heaven? I do. Hit, 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 hit me with them. It's three times four. They tell me, they tell me that heaven is 375 that way, 375 miles. Miles. Right, miles. miles. 375 that way and 375 that way. That's a whole lot of heaven. Lot of heaven. Amen. Woo. Did you know that? And when they talk about the jewels that's in heaven, you know, people be strapped down with jewels, but you have no idea of the beauty of heaven. Why? Because the Bible tells us it has not even entered into your love. You can't even think about heaven. And when I begin to think about what God has done for me, you know what? The Bible says that there's a mansion up there, got my name on it. And all I have to do, Paul, is try to be right. All I got to do is try to love you, Eva. All I got to do is stop talking about you because most of the time what you're talking about is wrong. That's right. Amen. Amen. Brittany, she's not here so I can say this. Don't y'all tell her either. Amen. Don't tell her. She knows this. Brittany walked up to me when we were over at the Ebenezer Church and she said, I absolutely don't like you. Mm. What? You, you don't like me and then you're telling me you don't like me. I know. <laughs> and I said, I know I'm crazy, but that's about as crazy as crazy. She walked up to me and she said, I don't like you. And I said, well, that's got to be your problem. Right. Brittany, that's got to be your problem because I don't even know you really. And I'm most sure that you don't know me to just simply say that you don't like me. And let me tell you something. Brittany and I are very good friends now. You know why? Because Brittany had not taken the time to study me. Brittany had not taken the time to learn that I'm a human being and about as crazy as anybody in the world. But I can be as kind as I can be. Amen. So all I want to say to you today is... 
put something in your mind that makes sense. Amen. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? We go to the scriptures. That's right, baby. You get with some friends that's talking about God. That's right, baby. That's right. I'm telling you. Don't go getting with the friends that's got to take you every time you go somewhere. You got to do something stupid, and then you go laughing about it as if it's the best thing in the world that has happened to you. Stupid is stupid. Is truth right. is truth. That's right. That's right. And you know what? When I look in the mirror and I look at some of my friends, they're looking 86 years old, and we're only 49. You know why? Because they've done things to their bodies that did not make sense. That's right. That's right. They haven't renewed their minds and wanted to be different. You know, if I say something to you today that makes sense, you know, you say, I've got my mind made up mm -hmm. and I won't turn back. Mm -hmm. Because one thing about it, it would be terrible for us to come to church every Saturday mm -hmm. and go to hell. Yeah. It would be a terrible thing. I'm in church on Saturday and Sunday, every morning, standing up, singing praises, giving God the glory. And let me tell you something about that. You have to take it as a privilege. The pastor has passed out the names. You even put down and said you wanted to do this and you wanted to do that. And a lot of times before the year is over, people are complaining. Didn't nobody come to my program? Didn't nobody support me? You know what? But I'm here to tell you when you walk into heaven, you're walking in or riding in or flying in by yourself. So it's be plenty of times that you may be doing something by yourself. Because the one thing, how many of you, honestly, don't raise your hand because it's embarrassing sometimes. How many of you honestly take time every day? Please don't fool yourself. Don't try to fool me. When do you honestly take time to give God some time? Listen, I don't want you to, I'm not laughing and playing. I'm serious about this. You need to make up your mind. We need to renew our minds to give God some of our time. We got to practice doing that. You got to call your buddy up on the phone. Michelle worried me to death calling me. I said, Lord, here she is again, screaming in my ear, talking about how good God is. But you know what? She could be calling me drunk. Listen, listen, I'm going to tell this. I'm going to tell this because I can. She used to drink. And she wouldn't call me because I wasn't going to cut her no slack. I don't want to be bothered with a drunk, crazy-talking person. And I'm as crazy-talking as anybody that comes. But rest assured, it's my own craziness. Call somebody that's talking about God. See something good. Listen, when you talk about the tabernacle of praise on Facebook, on your job, or whatever, if you can't say something nice, don't talk at all is my advice. Why do you feel the need to put down our best efforts? Lord, you know what? I'm doing the best I can. And if you're looking at me and you're saying, you know what, she ain't doing nothing, what are you doing to help me? Because obviously you got more sense than me. You, you got it, and if you got it and I'm so stupid and I'm so dumb, help me. And then when help comes, don't run it away. Realize that it's help. I'm telling you I don't want to go to heaven by myself, but I tell you what, I'll strap up and boot up and book on in there by myself. Elaine, I want to go to heaven. Sheila, I want to go to heaven. I want to be saved, and we got to stop playing with it. We've got to start transforming our minds. We've got to start renewing our minds. And the last thing that I want to say today, that God is good. And I accept the privilege and the responsibility for what he's given to me. And I challenge you today, you don't know your purpose? If you haven't found a church home someplace, if you don't know where you belong, just start reading, please. I'm so serious. Just start reading. This is the best book that's ever been written. If you want to read some about killing and blood and guts, write in here. And the stories are there just not for your, your fantasy to enjoy the blood and killing, but there's a message there. If you want to read about romance, Oh, my God, it's right in here. That's right, that's right. If you want to know how to be saved, it's right in here. Amen. If you want to know how to be in relationship with other people, it's right in here. Amen. Amen. You keep searching and looking and trying to find out from Socrates and trying to find out from, from Plato and all those different people. They've written all that kind of foolishness about evolution. I want you to know one thing. I did not evolve from a monkey hanging in a tree. 
I'm so glad to be who I am, and I'm so glad to be a part of God's creation. I'm so glad to walk in. Uh, you know what? I hate it when Christians had their heads down. Coming up in here, oh, my goodness. We have, look, look, this is all I'm asking you to do. When you think about the fact that you're nothing, and there are so many people that have had so many bad experiences, really, and they start thinking that they're nothing because of what their experiences have given to them. Mm -mm. That's the devil's lie. That's the devil's lie, and that's what the devil wants you to be thinking, that you're nothing. I know I'm somebody, and I make no apology for that. So if you leave here today and you're mad at me, I make no apology for the fact that God made me Beverly. And you need to walk in the fact that God made you you. And God made you to do something for him. God made each and every one of us, and you've got something that you can do for God. You say, I can't do, you don't have to be no singer. Let me tell you something. I don't mind cleaning God's house. Who in here cannot push a vacuum? Because you know God's house needs to be cleaned, amen? amen? You sit up there and you ask the question, I can't do nothing but ride the bench. That is not true, but if you're going to ride it, bring your money. Because we'll take your money. But I'm saying to you, really, soul search. Get some knowledge in here, in your mind. Amen. And ask God to make things clear, because if all of us, we're working in God's house to have God to come, to come soon. This place would be busting open. We'd be running crazy. I mean, things would be happening. Stop finding fault with each other. You love me? You really love me? You love the Lord? You need to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind. Everything that you have. God gave it to you. Please, if you leave here today and you don't see where you need to make a change, think again. What's on your mind? What will you think about this week? What will you read about in God's word? What will you practice doing? What will you practice? What, how can you practice the scriptures? Read them and then talk them, say them experience them, live them, feed them, breathe them, and then think about the sacrifice. Amen. There's no way that I can stand here today without remembering that the sacrifice that was made on my behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you know you're no good. You know you've sinned. Just yesterday, you, you said something you shouldn't have said. Thank you, Jesus. Just this morning, you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at. Even now, you're thinking something that you shouldn't even be thinking. The Bible says that we need to come on one accord. We need to come together, and we need to, to make ourselves think the same kinds of things. Heavenly things. God things. Pack your suitcase like you're going to heaven. Find out about that place. Find out what it is that you need to do. Not tomorrow, folks. Today. Make a difference today. Make a difference right now. If God is asking you to do something and he's moving in your spirit right now. I've been wanting to do this drive out negative thinking and I, I was talking to a gentleman on the phone and he said, Beverly, stop complicating it. Stop complicating it. Do it. And I just started talking to a musician over at the Methodist church. Just do it. And then the minister over there said, Beverly, I want you to do a workshop for my people. Then I got another call from Michelle saying, there's a retreat. We want you to do the workshop for the people. Drive out negative thinking. People, I am really about positivity. I'm really about not, not about negativity. God doesn't want us to dwell in negativity. He does not. And it's my thing. Find yours. Find it. I'm pleading with you to remember the cross, to remember the sacrifices that Jesus made for us. Please don't sit there and think that you've got tomorrow. Please don't think that you can keep doing what you're doing. And be saved. Heaven is real. Y'all know what, people? Somebody's going to hell. Somebody's dying. Somebody's going to die and not make it in. Oh, God, don't let it be me. Don't let it be you. Let us pray to God. It may or may not be clear what's on our mind. But God, I'm clear that you want us to have you increase in our thoughts every day, 
everywhere, every place that we go, every life that we touch. Someone needs to see Jesus in us. Someone needs to be reminded of the nails that went through his hand. Someone needs to be reminded that even while he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. God, we need to be reminded that a sacrifice was made on our behalf. God, help us to put something in our mind. Help us to be renewed and to be transformed so that we could live for you. So God, I love you now, even now. And I adore you, God, and I expect wonderful and big and and huge things to happen in this space and in this place because you said it. So, God, if we think it in our minds, it can become a part of who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.